So um, I hope that works and you can all see my screen all right. It's all good. It's all good. All good? Excellent. Yes, thank you. So I'm pleased to hear that. Um, so yeah, my, to the, um, my topic for today is literacy in heritage language, language maintenance. Some of you will have heard me speak um, previously at the um, community schools conferences like two years ago. And you might remember that there I used um, a comparison where I said um, language is like a wheel, language is a tool. And if you have one language, that's like one wheel, you know, one wheel can get you places and that's fantastic. Um, another way to get around is to have two wheels, to have a big one and a small one. That's also excellent to, you know, use your wheels and get around, but the best way to move fast and smoothly is actually to have both your wheels nicely inflated and nicely balanced and that's the way to go fast. And um, that's the same with language, that's the same with bilingualism, except of course, or as long as the people who made the wheels knew what they were doing. Unfortunately, um, when it comes to literacy in bilingualism, the people who make the wheels all that often don't know what they are doing. And so that's my topic for today. Um, how can we actually support the literacy learning of heritage language in a better way? Now, um, to see where I'm coming from, I need to talk a bit about um, literacy in language learning or in language generally. We often say things like, you know, I know a language, I speak German, I speak English, I speak Chinese, and we don't really make a distinction between spoken and written language. However, of course, um, the full proficiency range of a language relates to the four skills, to Spoke, speaking and hearing, speaking and listening on the one hand, and um, the written skills, so reading and writing on the other. And that's what I mean when I talk about literacy. I mean the skills of reading and writing, basically. Now, going back to my wheels analogy, what happens when the people who make the wheels don't know what they are doing is a situation where um, the bilingual person has low levels of literacy in both their languages. And um, I'll get to how often that happens later. So that's the, um, that's the SADI on my um, screen. I've got the SADI there because that's actually a really unfortunate outcome um, in minority education when you have low literate persons who are not, who don't have the right literacy proficiencies um, that are really needed in today's world. The much more common outcome is the one where you have, you know, this large wheel and the, sh and, and the small wheel where, um, and that's sort of neutral in terms of linguistic benefits, that the um, neutral smiley in the middle. So where you have a um, high level of literacy skills in um, one language and low levels or no literacy skills in the other language. Now, typically in the Australian context, language A is English, and um, the other language, the heritage language, is the one where a student has not learned how to read and write. And finally, um, the ideal that we're sort of aiming for is a situation where um, a student can in both has all the four skills in both their languages. Um, let me just ask you, or, or think, I mean, obviously I can't ask because this is not an interactive situation, but what do you think how often, how frequently each of these scenarios occurs? Um, you might be thinking, oh, well, I mean, bilingual kids, you know, they are double plus no matter what. Um, 
I'll show you some numbers from the US now and you'll be surprised to find um, that the most frequent outcome of heritage language education is actually um, the situation in the middle that's kind of neutral with regards to the benefits of bilingualism, where you have high levels of proficiency in language A, that's the dominant language in the US, that's English as it is in Australia, and no or very low levels of proficiency in lit literacy in um, the heritage language. That's the most frequent situation. Um, the second most frequent situation, about a fifth of um, heritage language learners are actually fortunate enough to um, acquire strong reading and writing skills, not only in English, but also in the other language. And that's really when um, you find most of the benefits of bilingualism, both for the individual and for a society, and where you, know, you, you are able to function fully as an adult in both your languages, in both your communities. Um, the most concerning outcome is, of course, that also close to a fifth of um, heritage language learners end up in a situation where they neither have strong literacy skills in English nor in their heritage language. And that's a really difficult situation to be in in um, today's world. As I told you, these figures are um, from the US. But now let me show you some Australian figures. They look slightly differently because, you know, we've done different research in Australia. The figures that you see here on the slide are from the, um, pro from the OECD's program for international assessment of adult competencies, also known as PIAC. That happens every couple of years. So it looks at... Um, literacy and numeracy and digital skills of the adult population in a couple of countries. And um, it distinguishes five literacy levels. Now I've, to make it a bit easier here, I've kind of grouped them into three levels. So there is level below level one and level one, that's very low literacy skills. That's, um, and this is only in English now. Um, that's fairly low literacy skills. That's around the level of literacy that you can expect someone to have who's um, gone through elementary education. So basically their um, literacy is at elementary level. In Australia, 13.7% of the population, of the adult population, have such low literacy skills. And that's um, really extremely concerning in a sense that um, these are the people who, um, you know, are unable really to fully participate in um, our contemporary knowledge economy in a democratic society. Um, one study that we've recently been looking at here at Macquarie is, for instance, readability of um, COVID-19 instructions. And one of the things that we've been finding is that a lot of the government information, a lot of the public service information is actually pitched at a higher level. So you have um, a fairly large number of people, or, and I mean 13.7% um, of the Australian population translates to well over 2 million people who um, will have difficulties understanding or reading um, public service information related to COVID restrictions. The level two and three are um, high school kind of graduation level. So that's where the majority of the population sits and level four and five are high levels of literacy that are typically associated with a university education. Now, um, so that's the explanation of um, the purple figures and the bar graphs. 
I hope that was reasonably clear. Now, what I want you to focus on is the numbers be below the bar graphs in um, black and gray, and that's for ESB and NSB. So ESB stands for English background and NSB stands for non-English speaking backgrounds. And so these are the figures of the Australian population from an English speaking background and from a non-English speaking background who um, achieve at each of these three levels. Now, one more thing that I have to, um, that you have to keep in mind here is that these ESB and non-ESB um, figures are for the Australian born. So what I've taken out of the figures is actually all the migrants. So you don't get any distortion between um, first generation immigrants who may have come as new migrants and um, may not speak English very well. The figures that you've got here for the Nesby population are people born and educated in Australia. And among children or adults who were born and raised in Australia, educated in this country, um, but speak a language other than English at home, 14.7% of them can only read and write in English at the level of an elementary school student. So this is a really pro problematic figure. And um, it is, you know, 3% higher than it is for the English speaking background figure background students. Now, of course, language background is not the only factor that um, results in low literacy outcomes. Um, parental education, socioeconomic background um, in particular, also very, very important. Um, if we go to the other end of the scale, to the high achievers, um, we find another significant discrepancy in that um, people from English speaking background homes actually are quite a bit more likely with 16.9% um, to achieve these very high levels of literacy where they are able to read and write with confidence and comfortably um, highly academic texts um, such as are required at university. And um, only 10% of adults from non-English speaking backgrounds achieve such high levels. Okay, now let's for a moment um, put aside these 14.7% of NSBE students who don't achieve high literacy levels in English. So that's obviously something where we have a problem and something that we need to look at how can we fix that. Um, but let's now look at the much larger number of 85% um, of so of students of, of Australian adults from non-English speaking backgrounds um, who have, you know, literacy levels at the level of the um, English speaking background people and who do well. Um, what we still find with this population is they read and write very well in English, but they may fall short and they're quite likely to fall short on um, literacy in their home language, in their heritage language. Now, what does that mean? Let me quote you um, just from the experience of Sarla Sawari. I'm quoting from um, an article by Sheila Pham. Um, locked out of the mother tongue, where she quotes um, this young woman, a um, very accomplished and aspiring writer from an Afghan background, born and raised in Australia, who says, my experience has been one of being locked out of Dari because I am basically illiterate in the language. Although I'm quite fluent, I can't read or write it myself. It blocks you off from delving into the literature of that language and the knowledge that it carries of the culture. And um, that's the most typical experience of um, heritage language learners in Australia. So um, around, as I said earlier, 
22% or so, a fifth of the um, non-English speaking background population achieve high levels of literacy in both their languages. 80% um, actually don't achieve high levels of literacy um, or don't learn to read and write at a level that allows them to read confidently, fluently um, texts of um, that go really beyond anything that's um, a bit more complicated than let's say a primary reader and um, that really can you know hurts them in a sense that they may be able to communicate with their families and have this kind of what's often called kitchen language the kitchen language of the second generation so they're comfortable interacting speaking the language but they really feel locked out a bit of um, the, the larger culture that is carried through literacy. Another reason why it's important to consider what can we do about these large numbers of children who grow up in Australia lacking the confidence or lacking the ability to read and write and what does that do for their confidence as in this example is um, that as you may have seen this recent report from um, uh, about who gets to tell Australian stories about the underrepresentation of linguistically and culturally diverse um, Australians in the media, there is of course this experience of marginalization and one thing I um, need to talk about a bit is that a language changes in the context of migration the language changes in the sense that you know back in the country of origin it's a dominant language it may not be the dominant language but you have a different scenario all languages become marginalized in um in the context of migration so heritage language learners generally have that experience of marginalization of their language and very often this goes hand in hand with other aspects of marginalization the experience of racism for instance so there are all kinds of differences and that um, leads to a, a some sort of linguistic insecurity that we find in people who don't have strong literacy skills but if they, particularly if they don't have strong literacy skills in both languages, but also if you don't have those, those literacy skills in the heritage language. Now I've got a couple of points here in um, brackets. The couple of points that I've put in brackets are um, lower self-esteem, perceived stress, negative affect, depression and anxiety symptoms. I've put them in brackets because um, there are there is a large number of um, qualitative studies from around the world that actually show that second generation children um, are much more affected by mental health issues. At the same time, I've put it in brackets because um, there is a huge variety of experience, significant diversity. These things affect different people in different ways and it would be wrong to say this is true of all second generation person this is not so i don't want you to go away with that message however i want you to um, go away with the message a message that many um parents many migrant parents know that their children will experience marginalization, they might experience racism, they might experience all kinds of difficulties. And so as parents, of course, we want to protect our children. And um, many parents actually give up the heritage language precisely because they want to protect their children and they don't teach it because they kind of think, the best way for them is to integrate. Except one thing that we are finding is as long as other markers of difference persist, um, children then they become adults, of course, may still experience marginalization. And um, one thing that can help them then is actually being grounded, being strong in both worlds. So a good protection and against 
all kinds of experiences of exclusion is actually being strong in both your English language and your heritage language. And that's important for all of us precisely because of um, media reports such as these, where we know that um, the diverse Australia is underrepresented in the media. We need stronger voices, we need more confident writers to actually enter the media. So this is not only a story of exclusion, this is also a story of we want, we want people who are able and capable of and, and confident enough to um, you know, raise their voices in all their languages. So what can we do? Now, um, the best practice to ensure high levels of proficiency, particularly in literacy in both languages is through dual language education. Another important point here to remember is that literacy is usually acquired through the education system. That's true for everyone, irrespective of what kind of background you have. You know, children learn how to speak in the home, but um, they go to school specifically to learn how to read and write. The um, best evidence that we have in terms of um, bilingual literacy skills is really the ideal scenario is on um, the golden rule where we have sort of 50-50 representation, where we have symmetry between the two languages, so instructional symmetry, that both languages are used as medium of instruction, so they are used not only as um, in language class, but they are also used to actually teach content. So teach math, teach political science, teach sociology, teach, you know, whatever content, social studies, religious studies, um, the sciences, whatever you teach. So ideally, both languages um, are symmetry. You have resource symmetry. So that means kind of similar numbers of books in both languages. You have teacher symmetry. That means all teachers are bilingual, but ideally you have um, uh, teachers from both backgrounds uh, for who each language is the stronger language and ideally you have student symmetry so similar number of students for both languages that's the ideal scenario in Australia we pretty much don't have that um, what we actually have is um, something that one of my PhD students has um, Victoria Benz in the book that I've got here has researched extensively. What we actually have is an unsupportive policy environment. We have the dominance of English, we have parental apathy, and we have a lack of student motivation. So that's pretty depressing. Now, um, I don't want you to be depressed because um, this is something that we cannot change or we cannot change um, in the short term. But what we can change, and that's where everyone, each and every one of you, of us, as language teachers, as community language teachers, as parents, as um, just people who care about the next generation of Australians, what we can do is um, the following. We can actually support children to learn how to read. And in order to tell you what it is that we need to be doing, I need to be talking a little bit about what learning how to read involves, whether that's learning how to read in one or more languages. And learning how we learn to read, we go through um, a couple of different stages. So there is the emerging pre-reader stage that's, um, preschool that's before we go to school i'll say what that involves in us or i'll say what it involves right now so that's sort of the stage where we where children from day one in a sense they learn how to read and write because what helps them to read what what um creates the basis for reading is knowing words all those nursery rhymes that you kind of think, um, you know, what's the point of that? We just do it to amuse our children. We don't just do it to amuse children, you know, stuff like hickory dickory dock. Um, 
that's actually fantastic in giving children the skills to segment language to understand sounds and that's real being able to segment sounds is one of the most important skills once you get to um, the reading and writing stage because you need to learn how to match letters to sounds so all those experiences that um, young children have through rich vocabulary, through learning about sounds, learning to manipulate language, but also learning to interact, learning to um, respond to questions, for instance. All that is like, you know, something that creates the foundation for their reading learning once they enter school. Once they enter school, they become novice readers. They really need to learn how to match letters and sounds. So they need to become really decoding experts. So they need to decode um, the visual shape of the signs on the page. Um, for English, that's the alphabet. For many other languages, that's the alphabet. Um, or for all the alphabetic languages, um, then we have the syllabary languages. So there really is this connection between um, between the letter shape and a sound. And then um, we have Chinese characters, which are more logographic, um, still being able to match visual, recognize visual shapes, decode them, match them to sounds is very important there too. And of course you need to match all those letter shapes and those sounds that you know how to match them to actual words and concepts. So that's what the novice reader needs to learn. They need to become decoding readers. Now these four three stages happen in elementary age. Uh, so emerging pre-reader happens before children go to school. Two and three happens in elementary education. And then there is a gap and the gap is there um, on my slide because um, not everyone, as I told you earlier, then actually is able to make that transition and goes on to become a fluent comprehending reader or an expert reader. Where we most can, where we can do most is really at stages one, two and three. Also because that's where we still have the children in our care more than anything as community language teachers in particular as parents too. So let's um, talk a bit about the emerging pre-reader. What can you do as a bilingual teacher? Well really it's about books, books, books. Um, expose young children from day one and I think as community teachers one thing that you can do is actually get your parents on board. Um, by the time you get children in the community school, by the time teachers kind of get their hold on students, they already have so many experiences and parents really need to be on board. So one thing that all of us can do is actually lobby parents, support parents. And if we are parents, of course, you know, give our children the joy of reading and, and being able to experience the pleasure of books from a very early age. That's going to be so good for them. And um, in particular, don't worry about which language or what all kind of reading material is really, really important. But as you still have that chance, really support the home language. Now, um, our libraries, our public libraries in um, New South Wales are really very good and have um, lots of material also in other languages. So um, make use of those resources and um, lobby for more resources. The photo that I've got here is actually from um, the public library in Hamburg in Germany where I was spending um, some research time 
last year and um, where they have a, a fantastic library section which is all headed under the title Eine gemeinsame Welt which is like a joint world and then has um, lots and lots of children's books in all kinds of languages so that's really fantastic um, our own public libraries are also doing very well and um, one thing where I really think actually the, um, the pandemic is almost a bit of, um, of a chance to think about new ways of doing things is also to just use online resources more. I think we've all just, um, I mean, most of us are pretty much over Zoom and over online and everything, but at the same time, I think um, we've had a chance to discover all the kinds of resources that are out there online. And it's very important. And I think it's a good opportunity to actually also look around, you know, outside Australia, what's on in terms of literacy materials in your home country, in the country of origin that can be used with young children. Now, while I'm really happy to talk up these you know, this variety of resources that the digital world has made available to us. There's also um, one thing that we know from research that is actually quite dangerous, and that is don't just plonk your child in front of a um, device and um, let them play with some literacy game on their own or you know give them something to watch that's a very passive way of learning and doesn't actually give them all that much in terms of um becoming you know gaining all those foundations that the pre-reader needs to gain because language fundamentally is a social skills we don't learn language from a screen kids don't learn language from a screen they need to interact and um like a lot of good research has shown for instance that even bedtime stories can be differentially beneficial and one thing that really makes a um, bedtime story so beneficial is that parents talk to their children about what it is they are reading they ask them questions so they don't just read to them but they interact with them that's a really important skill for little children to learn and um, it's typically middle class parents who are pretty good at that and who convey an advantage on their children in this way because they kind of already model ways of um, dealing with books that are very valued in schools whereas some um, parents would just you know and that's what a screen does just you read you pay attention but it's a very passive skill the child is not socialized into interacting around books and that's really what gives them a fantastic foundation so we can do a lot around heritage language maintenance in the early years and make use of the early years because um, that's where you are in control in a way that you'll never be again and also that's the foundation on which all later language learning and particularly reading and writing builds so lay those foundations and we can all lay them irrespective of what the policy environment is like in Australia. Let's move on to um, the novice reader. That's really, that's the kind of level where you meet children in school. Um, as I said, the novice reader is really a code breaker. They are code breakers and that they need to break the code of the visual symbols on the page but also the codes of um, sounds link the visual sign on the page to a sound that they already know and then link it all to a word so and become vocabulary code breakers if you will um, what what really makes people or children learn to do that is practice 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 so practice is what's important there um, and that's the challenge for community readers i think because for community teachers excuse me in um, the community schools 
often already children come along with kind of weaker um, skills and then you just don't have the kind of time that um, that is needed to um, successfully transition readers to the next stage in that language um, in contrast to English for instance which you know really takes over so I think um, one lesson that is important there is um, to be really really creative because at that stage that's around the stage when actually if you can get children through that stage then they become independent readers and once they become independent readers they do their own thing and their reading grows and grows and grows so you really need to give them that enthusiasm and that that foundation that comes with practice but that also keeps them going and keeps them engaged um, at a time when you know there is so much competition it's not only that the heritage language or learning how to read and write in the heritage language competes with English it also competes with sports and with a million other things that these children want to do I also need to acknowledge here that um, different language combinations have different challenges. Um, if your heritage language is one that also uses the Latin alphabet, of course your challenge is a lot less than if you need to teach another alphabet or another writing system. And um, these are certainly challenges that are different for different languages and every kind of community school related to each and every language needs to figure out some of these challenges for themselves but one thing that we can all learn from each other is um, just the importance of having reading and writing materials in a child's life and the reason this is so important is because at around the time we are talking about now, um, early elementary, there is something that kicks in and that's called the Matthew effect. And I'm not sure if you've ever heard about the Matthew effect. It's also called the Matthew effect of um, accumulated advantage. It's the basic principle of, <coughs> excuse me, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. It's named Matthew, not after some poor guy who didn't learn how to read. Um, it's named after the Matthew Gospel in the Christian Bible where Jesus at some point says those who have shall be given and those who don't have even the little that they have will be taken away from them. In reading that means that um, good readers improve faster and faster because the joy of reading carries its own reward so um, someone who has had lots of positive experiences with language and with books at an early age before they go to school learns how to decode faster and then that kind of gives them more pleasure and motivates them more and they will go on to actually read and write by themselves and that will teach them new vocabulary new content they will discover that it's all interesting and that there is a whole world out there in books where you can get lost and where you can learn and where you can grow and um so these kids who make that discovery learn faster and faster whereas um, readers who don't make that discovery or who start out um, maybe with weaker language skills um, and then it takes them longer to learn how to decode it takes them longer to learn actually um, the alphabet or the writing system of the language it takes them longer to uh, you know to sound out words and so it's really boring and laborious and they don't take pleasure out of it so they get stuck in a negative cycle whereas the good readers get stuck in a virtuous positive self-reinforcing cycle so that's the key message here for all community teachers for all parents um, make sure you expose your children 
to um, all kinds of reading materials. And you know what? It doesn't even matter whether this is like um, a fairy tale story or the cereal box that you look at for breakfast. Um, what matters is to actually bring literacy into your everyday lives and make it all interesting and make it fun and um, create that lifelong spirit of inquiry that will st uh, st be in good stead for your children as they grow up and as they need to function in a society like ours that is characterized by the need to learn forever and ever. And so lifelong learning is enabled by acquiring literacy skills in childhood as early as, you know, to lay that foundation from day one, because lifelong learning basically involves being able to read. That's where you get your learning from in the long run. That's pretty much it from me. Um, where can you find out more? Um, Alex showed you the two books that, um, or two of the books that I've written, Linguistic Diversity and Social Justice and Intercultural Communication. Um, both of them have chapters on bilingual education. If you can't get your hand on books right now, or that's not so much your thing, make sure to log on to Language on the Move, where we run a reg regular research blog. At the moment, we've got a series going about literacy challenges and all kinds of aspects of questions around learning how to read and write and um, the ability to read and write in more than one language. There you can also um, connect to our research. Um, most recently, um, a PhD thesis that has just been completed by Ying Wang about the heritage language maintenance of Chinese migrant children and their families. So um, lots of relevant research that you can connect to through the language on the move website and um, we've also got a YouTube channel and on our YouTube channel we've currently got four videos and um, a little video series that gives you a new video pretty much every two weeks or so um, around questions of reading and writing so um, head over there if you're interested in videos you can look up the invention of writing the Latin alphabets takeover of the world's languages or um, currently my favorite, the mind-altering magic of literacy. With that, um, thank you very much for your attention and I'll stop sharing